everyone, I'm Rosie. I'm Bill. And I'm Bobby. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the Rosie, Rosie and Bill Show. Show. And we are going to jump right in tonight with our amazing special guest. Oh, he's sweet. Yes, amazing. singer Bobby Brooks Wilson. Yeah. Bobby is a great singer. And I've seen him perform. He is charismatic and really funny. He does impersonations. And also, Bobby is the son of legendary singer Jackie Wilson. And I'm very, very shy. He's very shy. <laughs> he had fit in here. His arm. <laughs> and actually, on the night that we are taping the show, because our audience does know that we tape the show, mm -hmm. Bobby is performing at the Davenport Center for the Performing Arts in doo wop, soul, and rock and roll. So we're getting ready. So we we will get we you out in time. I promise. We have a we have a live show tonight, folks. So hopefully, some of you got a chance to see it. And if you did, call in, tell them, let them know. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you like me. If you love the show, I'm Bobby Wilson. Of course, if you did not like my show, I'm Bill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's who I am. So, Bobby, uh, when did you know you wanted to be a performer? Um, I'm glad I got the chance to tell you this. <laughs> Actually, I think it was when I first saw Michael Jackson. Now, I didn't know I wanted to be one, but I saw the Jackson 5. Oh, man, I'm dating myself. I saw the Jackson 5 on YouTube, and <laughs> I was, nice and, try. No, it was American <laughs> Bandstand, and uh, my sister called me in from outside, was playing outside, and I saw the Jacksons doing uh, I Want You Back, and I went nuts, and I said, I can do that, and I immediately ran outside, set up four chairs with brooms, and I was Michael, and I made people sit and watch me do <laughs> I want you back. So I guess it was always in me, but I really didn't think about it. I, I guess it's just being a kid, you know, think about those things. You were telling us about a fish fry that we used well, you, to perform. You used to take the stage. Well, I didn't know I was performing. <laughs> uh, in the South, they have, uh, you know, I was, I was born in Westbury, Long Island, but I was raised in the South, and uh, South Carolina. And my mom would have once a month a Friday night fish fry, which means she'd invite all her friends over, they'd listen to music, and they would... Uh, uh, fry fish and uh, she would always you know we had a basement in our house and she put the kids in the basement said nobody allowed to come upstairs while the adults have their night to themselves but I always snuck up and she always pointed her finger in my face and said tonight's my show not yours <laughs> and I'm like what's this crazy lady talking about my show and then I guess as soon as the doorbell rings you know I go ba da 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 <laughs> I guess I was dancing and everything <laughs> and I didn't know it so she catch up by downstairs. So I, she would send me downstairs, but I still would sneak up and and wind up in front of the people doing whatever it was I was doing. I don't even remember, but I remember that finger being my face. <laughs> <laughs> was your mother a singer? Uh, she, but only you know church, church uh, choir, gospel. You know she was on the gospel choir. Um, that's all she. You know she was a baby girl of twelve brothers. So she wow. grew up in the oh south. Her gosh. her father was a preacher. Five of her brothers were preachers. So she was very strong gospel, southern gospel woman, so, which was good. I needed it. <laughs> it was good. Yeah. So what is it that you want to communicate through your art? I think I never thought about that. I just love uh, performing. I just love uh, uh, what I've learned recently. I love the, the fact that music is healing. And I love the fact that people will come up to me after the show and say, that song you did, mm -hmm. uh, my, my husband was here, or my daughter, or my mother was here and uh, they passed and uh, and that was our song. I think mm -hmm. that's what it is and they cry and they hug and it's a healing thing and uh, so I feel like um, God has put me in a position where I, I, I heal. So I try to be uh, as positive as possible and especially and I like to deliver a message um, in, in my performance. So I feel I see myself as a servant to music and um, as long as I'm in front of them, I try to put out a positive message. And you know, you just touched on something that really struck me. I mean, I was familiar with your music. I was familiar with your father's music. But mm -hmm. the one thing that really struck me, the more I saw just clips of you performing, clips of you in prior interviews, was that positivity. Hmm. How do you manage to stay so positive My all the time? <laughs> My mom, uh, her name was Annabelle Davis, born and raised in Cordia, Georgia. She's deep root, deep south. And basically, you know, growing up, she would, you know, I grew up in the foster home, so she would point at all of us and say, you know, you guys are special, that's why you're here. God made you special, that's why you're here. And she would say that over and over and over. And she says, no excuses, you don't lean on nobody but yourself and God. Not even me. 
You don't lean on. You lean on yourself and God. That's all you need. And and I and as I got older, that's instilled in me. Hmm. So now I instill that in my boys. The same thing, because uh, I let them know I'm not going to be here forever. So they got to stand on their own while I'm here. And she told us that. And so that's what we. That's that's what brought me up. So. Uh, she also had another saying, when anybody throw dirt on you, like a mule, you brush the dirt off your shoulders and you stump it on your feet, because all it does is it lifts you higher and higher. Wow. Oh my gosh. And so that's what something an amazing mom. She used to say that all the time. Yeah, she says, if they're talking about you, you're important. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, you know, because she used to dress us up. And then, okay, now I'm talking, I was I raised, raised in the 60s, so she dressed us up. With, with, with um, bow ties and white suits and uh, plush uh, pleather leather shoes. What you call that? Um, yeah, like the, the patent, patent leather, patent leather yeah. shoes. Yeah, and and so I go to school and all the kids didn't have that. They were wearing the same clothes all week and and they're you know looking at us, me and my sisters, and picking at us and wanting to fight us because my mom got, I got a part on the side of my head, nice clean hair. I mean she had us sharp. I didn't think we were sharp, but she had us sharp. So uh, I remember the day I said to her, I said, I don't want to wear what you put out. She goes, when you work, buy your own clothes, you, then you can wear it. And then I started working at 12 years old. Wow. Because she basically pushed me to work because I had to wear what she told me to wear. What did you do at 12 years old? Paper route. I had a paper route. Yeah, so, and I bought my first pair of shoes, which were platform shoes. <laughs> <laughs> bought my first pair of bare bottom pants, jeans, because she wouldn't let us wear jeans. You know, she was she just she was just uh, she really dressed us to the nines. I had no idea. Now I wish I had. Now. <laughs> exactly. But then I didn't know. So. But that seems That's like where it such, comes from. Right. I was gonna say it also seems like just such a great way to teach you how to be independent. And she how did to that really a kind of lot. For yourself, no matter what. With all of us, she did that a lot. I mean, by the time I was eight years old, I was ironing my own clothes. She had me in the kitchen learning how to cook. Hmm. And she says, "You might get a sick wife." And I'm like, "I don't." A sick wife. Why would you say that? <laughs> you might have a sick wife. And you need to be able to cook and be able to clean. I'm like, uh, I'm eight years old. <laughs> you know, she's like, shut up. You know. <laughs> so, but I, so I was like, you know, you know, she was like a drill sergeant. So we get up in the morning before school. You clean your room. It's got to be neat. Everything's got to be put away. You got to um, um, get ready to eat your breakfast and out to school. So, so she was tough. She was a drill sergeant. Well, speaking of drill sergeants, <laughs> right? You were in the Navy for ten years. Yeah, that, that was that was great. I, I actually enjoyed the Navy. And thank you for your service. By oh, the way, thank too. you, thank you very much. I needed to escape from South Carolina. I, I was like, I want to see the world, so I joined the Navy. Uh, um, I was in school. I went to the University of South Carolina. I think for only one semester before I dropped out. I went to Midland Tech College, and uh, my high school. Sweetheart at the time wanted to get married, so I figured I got to have a job. Mm. That's why I joined the Navy. And next thing I know, my son came and, you know, life came. And so I made a decision I was going to do 30 years in the Navy. But like I said, God said, you, you make a plan, he laughs. Mm. And that's what happened. Because 10 years in, I passed those kidney stones and phew, medically pushed out. Wow. Yeah, and I was sitting there like, what am I going to do the rest of my life? And... Started hanging out with all the Sam Samoans and the Hawaiian guys, and at the time I was a big boy. I joined the Navy at 135 and got out at 240. <laughs> what? Wow. What? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so they thought I was Samoan, and uh, started letting my hair grow. And because uh, I in the Navy, I didn't. I used to shave my head. So, and uh, next thing I know, uh, Peter Hernandez, uh, Bruno Mars's father saw me singing in the karaoke bar with all these Hawaiians. Now, I was hanging out with people like Brother Iz and, and CC and Capono and the Casimir brothers. If you don't know who they are, these big, big stars, you know, Melvin Lee and uh, just hanging out. And uh, even uh, the Filipino star, which I didn't know he was a star, Martin Navira, uh, we had, at karaoke shows. Hmm. And, 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 uh, and I'm just there, you know, basically when I got in the Navy, I was pretty shy. So I was just sitting in the corner. And the guys just kept pushing me to sing. You know, I was like, I don't sing. Just, everybody sings. Hawaiians believe it. everybody has a song. The spirit of Aloha. So I started singing, and, and um, Peter heard me and said, hey, come and join my doo-wop group. Now, Peter's from Brooklyn, and he moved his whole doo-wop group to Hawaii. 
I guess they've been playing in Hawaii 12 years. And at the time, he was married to Bernie, uh, which is, uh, uh, he had five kids with uh, Bernie and uh, three, girl, three girls and two boys. And uh, Eric was, his, um, was uh, 16 years old at the time. Eric was playing drums for the show, The Love Notes. Little Bruno was five years old doing Baby Elvis in the show. <laughs> his, his mom was doing every female singer of the 60s. Wow. His mom could sing. She was, the most, she was a very beautiful lady. Bernie was, and, uh, and then Pete, and Pete was running the show, he had seven thriving businesses, and, uh, and the show. So I, I didn't know what I was walking into. He said, I thought it was for volunteer. So <laughs> he said, can you be here five nights a week and can you rehearse on Saturday? I'm like, yeah, because I was still in the Navy waiting on my discharge. And the Navy moves very slow, it took a year. So for a year, five nights a week, seven nights a week, we would, I would sing for an hour. And I was happy as a lark because I was just doing backup. Do what, do what, do what. I loved it. <laughs> and I was the only one on the group going. <laughs> and they were like, can you pipe it down? I'm like, what? And I'm not too loud? No, that, whatever that is, bring it down. <laughs> bring it down. I'm like, I don't understand. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> I had no idea what the heck they were talking about. I was too happy. Right. I didn't know it, especially when they you gave had me the my music first check. In you. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and he gave me my first check, and I went, "You get paid for this?" <laughs> <You know? laughs> the first night, Friday, it was a Friday night. I'm, I'm leaving, and one of the guys go, "Hey, where are you going?" I said, "Home." Why are you guys sitting around? We gotta get a check, fool. I said, a "Check? Why do you need a check?" And they looked at me like, "Oh, you still in the Navy? We do. This is our work." And I'm like, "Oh." So I'm getting the check. It goes, probably. <laughs> so I turned around and sat down and waited like the rest of the guys. And then Peter came out and had everybody's check and took my check and folded it in half, put it in my hand like this and says, I can't pay you what I paid the rest of the fellas. So uh, you got three months with that and then we'll see if you work out. So I didn't look at the check. I was like, cool, cool. all right, I, I'll, I'll take whatever because I'm still in the Navy. Right. I'm still drawing my Navy picture and everything. So I'm like, wow, extra money. Woo! <laughs> I get home, unroll the check, it's $1,000. I had never seen $1,000 my whole life. Wow. At once. <laughs> so I'll call Peter up on the phone and I told him this story. And he said, I don't remember. I called Peter up and I, I said, hey, Pete, this is Bobby. Hey, what's, what's going on? Well, I need to talk about my check. I told you, this is what you get. The rest of the fellows been with me for 14 years. You don't get what they get. Click. <gasps> <laughs> so I went, well, okay. <laughs> so I kept the check in my draw in my house for like. He you did didn't it. cash it? No, for like the first, the, probably the first month I have every week. I was, I'm like, woo, another one, woo, another, you know. And Peter finally came up to me and said, hey, come here. Are you cashing? Are you cash You're not cashing your checks? <laughs> and I'm like, okay. I need you to cash your checks. You're messing up my bookkeeping. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, I am? Because, yeah, put them in the bank, something, but cash them. You don't need the money? And I'm oh, yeah, yeah, I need the money. <laughs> and then he was the, like, who are you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I put the money in the bank, and I finally, uh, I, I walked around probably for two months with uh, my first money clip. And a hundred and a thousand dollars in a hundred dollar bills. I just walked, wouldn't spend it. I had to just get walked good. around, mm. just walked around. That's when I started. I said, you know what, this music thing I should check into. And I started checking out live entertainment, and I started checking out bands and other entertainers besides the Hawaiian guys I was hanging out with. And I was like, wait a minute, this is good. And then people recognized me and say, hey, come on, sing with us. They would call me up. Oh, hey, I see you. Hey, you the guy look like Jackie Wilson. Come on up. And so well, people, I, people would invite me to sing. So, I know at one point didn't Paul Revere uh, approach you as well? Yeah, he, you sure, were performing he, one he night? sure did. It was it was funny. Uh, um, this is a Legends in Concert show that was just opening up in the Royal Hawaiian Shopping Center, which was next to the Sheraton where we were. And rumor, you know, we was all excited because they had Michael Jackson, Madonna, Prince, all these lookalikes and impersonators. And nobody went to see the show because we worked just as much as they were working. We was doing two shows a night every night. Wow. So Paul Revere of Paul Revere and the Raiders and John Stewart, the producer, they were partners in that show. They came over. They wanted to see Bruno. That's why they came over. At that time, we were doing the Michael Jackson uh, medley. We were doing I Want You Back and uh, ABC medley.
So we had the big afros and the whole nine yards. And um, and Bruno probably was about probably seven or eight by then, getting tall. And he, and Bruno would bust out into Billy Jean routine. So uh, and so the John them came to see him. So everybody was excited. Oh, John, Paul Revere, the Raiders is here. And I'm like, who's that? Because I grew up in the gospel home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I, was, I didn't know who he was. I had no clue, you know. And so, as the show was over, you know, I was walking out the door, and Paul stops me. I mean, when I say stop, he abruptly stops. Me. Where are you going? And I'm like, uh, I'm going out the door. He goes, you know, well, you look like us. I said, yeah, yeah, I've heard it all. What do you mean, yeah, yeah? This guy was some guy, <laughs> you know. I said, yeah, yeah. He says, uh, he says, uh, can you sing like Jackie Wilson? Because I, I didn't hear you sing. You was doing all the background. I said, no, I'm just a background singer for the group. He goes, I want you to be my Jackie Wilson. You look too, much. oh my God, you look like you talk like him. He went nuts. And I said, nah, I'm not impersonated, but thanks for the offer. And I walked out. <laughs> and, uh, it was a place called Bobby McGee's, a nightclub. And uh, I used to hang out there after the shows. And I went to, one night I was there, and Paul Revere and his wife, Sydney, was there. And they saw me, and then Paul comes, Shoo! I told you I want you to be, you know. And I was like, oh, thank you so much. I, I, I just, I'm not into that. I'm, I'm an artist. I'm, I'm not going to do any impersonations. I'm, and he was like, are you out of your mind? Are you out of your mind? Have you been to the show? And I'm like, no. You got to come to the show. I blew him off. Hmm. Wow. Third time, I run into him somewhere. I don't know where it was. Oh, parking lot. <laughs> I was in a parking lot somewhere. And he saw me, hey, come here. <laughs> I'm like, you got to be kidding me. But this is what made me pay attention. My mom, she used to always tell us, if it comes in threes, God is talking. Mm. Listen. Hmm. If it comes to you in three ways, you listen and you pay attention because God is talking. And that's it. The third time he, he asked me, he said, I told you, I want you to do, have you seen the show? No, sir. I'm going to put you in. Can you come tonight? Yes, sir. I'll put you in for two. Okay. And I went saw the show and got blown away. I mean, I went so, and I said, I don't know how to begin. I said, I'm just a background singer on the love notes. I don't know how to begin to put something like that together. And he goes, it's very simple. You just, uh, when you go to sleep at night, dream of yourself on that stage. With the singers, with the band, with the dancers, just dream it up. Mm. And in six months, I want to audition. I said, well, I can dream. I've been dreaming my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> I've been dreaming my whole life. I've been dreaming about limos, big houses, mm -hmm. bitlies. <laughs> and he laughed. He says, dream it. He says, it works. It's effective. Do it. So I listened, and I started picturing myself on the stage. Next thing I know, I, I hired a band, and I hired some singers, and I got a video on Jackie uh, Wilson from a friend of mine um, black, that worked at Blockbusters. They ordered a shindig video. And I never forget her. Her name was Lisa Redoff. God bless her. She she's passed. She had her own club in Hawaii, and I asked her, would she help me put it together? She goes, when you get the video, come over to the house. She was just married to a guy at the time named Sergio, and her son Rudolph. And she said, come over to the house, and uh, let's look at it, and I'll see if I can walk you through. So I get the video, and then we go in the house, and I'm looking at the video, but I'm never thinking I look like this guy, you know. We get the video, we put the video on, and he opens up the show with a song called Danny Boy. And it's a silhouette of him standing there. And we turn the show on, and she, Lisa and her husband go, <laughs> and they look at me, and I'm like, that looks like me standing there. Wow. The same build, my neck. I mean, I'm looking at his position. That's the way I stand. So I was like, wow. She goes, well, you don't have to do anything. <laughs> and then, but she, they kept going. And looking at the video, and, and she goes, okay, well, you don't have to do any makeup. <laughs> you don't have to do. She says, you got to cut your hair, because at the time I had a long ponytail, like way down my back. I think I got some Indian in me or something. I don't know what it is. But my hair was way down my back. She goes, well, you got to cut your ponytail. I was like, no, nah, I'm not cutting that. And then Paul said, cut that ponytail. So, oh, you got to cut that out. <laughs> 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 so, when I start, yeah. so when I started working with Paul, I had to cut it. But uh, it, was, it was amazing that I saw this man, that it looked like me, it sounded like me, and I'd never seen him before in my life. And at this point, you did not know? No. Had no idea No, I'm just, I'm just going to do a, a tribute to Jackie Wilson. And if I can do the voice, hire a voice, uh, what you call it, a voice coach. Uh, she was an opera singer, uh, Rhonda, Queen of South Pacific. 30 golden albums she had, 
uh, from New Zealand. Mm. Wow. And she taught me a lot of vocal tricks. And I remember the first time I took her a tape, cassette tape, ooh, dating myself, <laughs> of Jackie Wilson. She goes, oh, that's your voice. And I'm like, no, I can't sing like that. She goes, you got that range. And she went up, up and down the piano. She goes, you have the range. You have the same range. And I went, I do? She goes, yeah, you just have a, a rougher version, a different color than he has. She he has, he has high blue, velvet, uh, yellow colors. You have the deep red, brown colors. That's what she described. How she did yeah. yeah, and I was like, this, this lady's crazy. Anyway, <laughs> she, got, she taught me breathing exercises, vocal exercises that helped me to create uh, my songs. And once I got with my music director, it was a piece of cake. Now, I've never auditioned for anyone in my whole life. And Paul said, you ready? I said, yeah. So I put together a 30-minute show oh my God. <laughs> with video, <laughs> the ba seven-piece band, and, back and four backup singers. I had them all in black dresses and tight, tight black dresses looking like, should we do what I'm about? And, and because I've never been in the business, nobody told me, oh, all you need is a karaoke track. You go and sing the song. But what I didn't want to do is I didn't want to leave anything to imagination. So I synced myself with a couple of songs and, and the outfits, and then I had the girls there and the dance moves. And I went up there, and they, the whole, uh, when I went to do the audition, the whole, uh, Paul said, okay, everybody, I'm, I need everybody to stay back and watch this guy's audition. He goes, uh, how many songs are you doing? I said, well, I got 30 minutes, and he laughed. He goes, okay. And I'm thinking, and did I do something wrong? <laughs> I get up there and I do the whole show, I throw myself on the stage, I'm crawling. <laughs> You know, the whole nine yards. And he stands up, and him and Paul, and says, uh, you're hired. They said, we never hired anybody like that. You're hired. I was the first one. And I was like, hired? Like, I have a job? They said, yeah, you got a job, buddy. You got a job. <laughs> and that was the beginning. Now, once I started that, then Jackie Wilson family came out of Woodwork. Yeah, the, yeah, so yeah. take us through that yeah. process. How well, did you actually find out? Well, I, I didn't find, I met a lot of the, the family members before I found out. What made uh, it, it really go forward was um, I was working for Legends at Bally's in uh, Atlantic City and the Four Tops were up upstairs and I was kind of excited because I was like, man, I would love to meet the Four Tops and make a long story short, um, Levi Stubbs and Lawrence Payton of the group were watching me for a week and they called uh, the, the entertainment director and said, hey, can uh, you bring this kid up here? We want to meet him. And when I walked, they took me to the green room and I was like, you know, thrilled to death, not knowing what to expect. And they looked at me and said, Lawrence Payton, you got to be family. And I'm like, what? And he goes, you got to be family. He goes, are you being Bobby or are you being Jackie right now? I said, I'm being, who? I'm being Bobby. How would Jackie be? Like you are now. Mm. Wow. And I'm like, huh? And then uh, Levi came up and went, <clears throat> You gotta get up early in the morning. Be like my dad, like my cousin. Early in the morning. He says, uh, "I don't know how you did it." That's what he said to me. Mm. And I said, uh, "I'm just being me." I said, "I only have one video of Jackie, and that does not describe." That video just shows him singing and dancing. It doesn't give you no no insight of who he was as a, a man. And uh, and I, and at that time there was nothing. I mean, all I found was one paragraph, and it just said he was an acrobatic. R&B superstar. That's all it said. Acrobatic vocal singer superstar. One paragraph. Every, every place I went, that's all I could find on Jackie Wilson. So, um, so everything else, uh, I just, I said, well, I got to be me. I remember Paul, when he hired me, he says, uh, I know you being you. He says, but you're being Jackie Wilson. And you don't know it. Mm. He said that to me. And I was like, what is he talking about? He's loony too, right? You know, these guys have been doing drugs in the 60s. <laughs> so, <laughs> something, what is he talking about? What are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so once that happened, the, uh, there's a, a man by the name of Billy Roquel Davis, who was my dad's first cousin, and, and, and so was Levi. And he wrote a lot of the songs along with Barry Gordy and Gwen Gordy, all Jackie tunes. He was... The one they called, they called, uh, they called him. He had a publishing company in New York called Chevy's Publishing, and they said, "Billy, you gotta come see this kid. You will think Jackie was reincarnated?" And Billy, just like everybody who knew Jackie, said, "Ah, there's only one Jackie Wilson. Even impersonator can't copy Jackie." 
And uh, Lauren says, I urge you to come see this kid. Now, they didn't ask me about my background or anything. They, uh, Lawrence just kept saying, here's my number, I'll keep in touch, you know, we got to talk. And, and unfortunately, Lawrence was suffering from uh, prostate cancer, he passed nine months after I met him. But Billy and I became very close, he became like a father figure to me. And Billy's the one that dug. Billy's the one that dug into me and said, okay, you know. And he asked me questions that, uh, and when I answered them, he knew my background because he knew some of the people that was involved in my life. And he introduced me to the rest of the family. And that's how I became, not got knowledge of my, me becoming a, a Wilson. He remembers your mother, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He knew who my mother was. Once he asked me who, what her name was, he knew who she was and where she lived. And I went, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> 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 so so it, it was, it was a strange, uh, way of coming around to this because a little bit from a little while I ran from it I, mm. because you know some of the Wilsons were loving me some of them weren't so I was like ah, I don't need it I don't need it I'm good I'm fine but um, I got really really close with my brother Thor and, and the rest of the family and uh, we went ahead and did the do and came back yep that's your daddy and <laughs> so I was like okay well, what now we hope you enjoyed our conversation so far with Bobby Brooks Wilson. In fact, we've got so much we talked with Bobby about, we split it into two episodes. Rosie, has it been fun so far? It is so much fun. I could just listen to him for days, tell all his stories. He has so many great stories. And the thing I like the most about Bobby is that he keeps it real. He does. He is very deeply rooted. He has great faith in God, and his priorities are in line. Yeah. They truly are. And the good news is we're going to hit, get to hear more of those amazing stories next week when we bring you part two of our interview with the incredible, the amazing Mr. Entertainment himself, Bobby Brooks Wilson. Bill, we had so much fun last yeah. week talking to Bobby that we didn't want our viewers to miss anything that he said because he's so entertaining and he's so real. Yeah. Lots of great stories. We heard some of them last week, and we are about to hear the rest of them right now. We hope you enjoy this as much as we did. In those days, all the big stars played the lounges of Las Vegas. He walked into the Sahara Casino and saw a group called Billy Ward's Dumbbells. They were performing in there, and they were there for four nights in a row. Elvis was so impressed, he went for a week straight. Thus started a relationship between my dad and Elvis that last over 25 years. So what I'd like to do right now is go back to 1956 and do my dad doing Elvis. Let's do it. Come on. back yep that's your daddy and so I was like okay well, what now and uh, I mean I kind of ran away from entertainment for a while I changed my name to Bobby Brooks Hamilton <laughs> and I went for that way for about three years why is that do you think I just wanted to have my own identity yeah. and, I, and I didn't want people going oh because even you know I've been working in impersonator world so they ah oh, they're looking at me like you are who you know, so I didn't want it. I, I just didn't want it. And I didn't want the negativity and whatever. And so, um, but, you know, I have a strong faith and belief in God. And I felt like every time I tried to run away from Jackie Wilson, I kept getting brought back. And my, my mom's in my head. You know, so a couple things happened that was three times that came, came up during that transformation of accepting mm -hmm. that I'm a Wilson. And when those things came up with my mom, talking to my head because she's now gone and 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 um, the way I was raised I knew that God put me here 
for this. So now I stand on my dad's shoulders, keep his music going, and I do my own music so I, I can identify myself. And one of my disclaimers now in show business is when, when the people come out and they've never seen me before and they're sitting there, you know, I said, first of all, I'm, I'm Bobby Wilson. There's never been another Jackie Wilson. I said, I'm going to... Uh, um, I'm going to do my take on my dad's songs. If you see my dad or hear my dad, great. But this is the best me I can be. So let's have fun. And that's it. A great way to look that's at it. That's it. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah, so let's have fun. Because you know, I don't even go, well, you don't sound like his dad. You don't look like a dad. Because if you, you don't start trying I, yeah. to be your dad, yeah, yeah, you're so losing not, your yeah, artistic. Not, and I never wanted to be my dad. Right. I mean, when the opportunity came up for me to play Jackie Wilson, hey, okay. I got an opportunity to do James Brown, the movie, uh, uh, the movie uh, that, that the Rolling Stones did. I got the chance to read the lead part, and it was so funny because the part they gave me to read was the scene when J um, James was dealing with his mom. I had the same scene because I, I didn't meet my mom till I was older. I grew up depending on me and God. Mm. That's who I depend on. So I tell my sons because you know I said uh, you know they got a lot of family now. I said, I don't want you guys calling everybody in the, in the, you know, when you get in trouble. I want you to get on your knees first. Hmm. Give God a chance first. And then, you know, if we can help, we can help. But I'm going to direct you. One thing I tell my oldest boy, he, don't, he hates it. <laughs> I know he hates it. When you call me with a problem, but he don't do it no more. He's older. And he's, he's very wise and very smart. But uh, when he was younger, he would call me with a problem. And I said, and he goes, Dad, blah, blah, blah. And I said, so what's the solution? He goes, what do you mean? I said, well, give me two solutions first before you call me. And I could tell he's like, you know. <laughs> and then I said, give me two solutions, call me back. Click. <laughs> does it work? It does work, but it pisses him off too. <laughs> but, you know, I, I notice now he always has solutions. But that, that is such a great way to teach yeah. that, you yeah. know. And, and, and mm -hmm. I know myself as a father, I would tell my son, you know, you got to have a comma. Yeah. At the end of the complaint or the right. gripe or the question, and right. after that comma is, mm -hmm. what do you think you should do about it? Right. Same type of yeah. thing. Because how well, else can kids ever get to think on their own and, well, and make their own decisions if you well, don't well, do that? I'm gonna tell you, my mom, you know, gave me a real brutal lesson of that. Uh, I was, you know, I got married very young and in Chicago, and make make uh, and uh, it was like 84 degrees below zero, and my son, <laughs> the, my oldest. Uh, Robert Jr. So it was July. In yeah, July. yeah. <laughs> he was like six months old, and I was going through uh, um, uh, electronic training in, uh, in in the Navy, and so I had my wife and my son there, and and I, I wasn't getting through it. But uh, besides that, I was an E two, so I was only having making like three hundred dollars every two weeks, plus a family, hmm. and I couldn't pay my light bill. My light bill was like four hundred dollars a month, and I and they was threatening to cut us, cut our light off, so. I called my mom up, say, Mom, can you just lend me $400 until I can get this uh, taken care of? And she goes, no. You're a grown man. You have a family. Figure it out. Click. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that is cold. And I'm like, did she just hang up on me? Hello? <laughs> I call her back, and I, she says, baby, you got to figure it out. You're a grown man now. I said, but, Mom, I know you have the money. I balanced your checkbook. She said, that's my money. Hmm. You got to get yours. Hmm. Click. She hung up again. <laughs> so... I was so mad about it. I was angry. I didn't talk to her for six weeks. I called myself punishing her. But what she did is I figured it out. And um, I wound up calling the, the light company and said, hey, uh, I want to pay my bill, but I don't make the money that the bill requires. And I said, well, well, what do you do for a living? I'm in the Navy. What's your rank, E2? Oh, baby, you live in below poverty level. We have a program for you. You pay $50 a month, and that's it. Give me your Social Security number, blah, blah, blah. Problem solved. Wow. So they but, helped you, but, so you I, could but, get on your feet. Right? Yeah. And in the long and in the long run, that ended up would have saved you a lot of money. That as a as someone serving yeah. this country should yeah. be able to benefit from anyway. But it made me inquire. It made me start right. research and made me say, okay, well, what can I do yeah. to solve this problem? Right. Because it was a problem. They was gonna cut our lights off, and at eighty four degrees below zero, we are gonna no. freeze. No. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and um and after that that lesson. I applied that lesson to everything else that came in my life. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, so I'm still solving problems. I'm mean, still, you know, I know where I want to go, you know. I don't, I'm not going to stop with this level of music. I'm going beyond as, as far as the stars can take me.
You know what, Bobby, on that note, I'd, I'd like to ask you about something that um, one of my favorite uh, albums that I listen to now, one of my favorite CDs on my iTunes playlist is mm. uh, one called It's About Time, came out in 2012. <laughs> And what I really liked about that was you had, you know, your father's biggest hit mm -hmm. on there, mm -hmm. but there were also songs on there that were your right. songs. Right. Critically acclaimed, great album to listen to. And if you guys are out there, you got to look it up on iTunes. It's about time, 2012. Well worth it. It's great. great. Every song on there is great. Thank you. Thank and I you. think shows your range. Uh, vocally shows a, a lot of different range in terms of the type of music that's on there. It's great. It's and great, I yeah. think that fifth song everybody will recognize as well. But the question I have is, is there anything else in the works? You were just talking about your music and where you want to take it, what you want well, to do. Do you have anything else on your well, own that might be in the works? Well, yeah, the, that label that, we, uh, that I'm on is a Plateau Music out of Nashville. I'm still on that label. We're working on my second CD now. We actually have a single going to Billboard uh, in August. We're going to shoot the video next month. The song's called Bridges. It's an original. Wow. It's a, it's a love song. It's a, you know, she broke my heart, and you know, and she started cheating <laughs> with somebody else. Oh. <laughs> yes. <Ooh. laughs> but but it, it's it's not horrible. It's 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 a kickback to the '60s. I want to say thank you, because the '60s is what put me on my feet. So it's an original song, but it's kind of a kickback for all, all the fans that come to our shows now. So we want. I wanted to do something like that, and then we have some other originals. Uh, that's coming out and that like it's about time was original that I wrote a uh, uh, long time ago and I finally got to record it with with uh, Tony Manter out of Plateau Music my, my producer uh, and manager and so uh, I'm very excited about the second album because I, I really get to explore more me in mm -hmm. the second album uh, I'll probably be only one or two songs by my dad that I'll cover but the rest is all going to be the originals and we're going to do that Michael Jackson formula Nine songs, the Thriller album. Okay. So, because <laughs> when he did nine songs, he got six Grammys. Another guy did that, Bruno Mars. Hmm. This album, 24 Karat Magic, nine songs. This kid got seven Grammys. Oh. Very proud of him. Bruno's killing it. He's yeah. an incredible yeah, artist. Yeah, he's, he's killing it. I'm, I'm really so proud of him. So this is my, you know, this is my goal. So, well, and you know what I think, too, what struck me, I mean, I think it's safe to say that your father's music is, is timeless and it's yes. transcendent generations. Yes. And I got a similar sense from listening to your original songs on It's About Time. And it's, you know, it's, you know, sometimes these days with music, um, you know, a lot of formats, a lot of stations have closed. You know, mm -hmm. you don't mm -hmm. have as much opportunity Good, in, in some places to listen, especially <laughs> yeah. to some of the older ones. But mm -hmm. I do appreciate the fact that there's that timeless sort of aspect, mm -hmm. you know, to it. It's not just going to be something that's, well, eh, I listen to it once and be done with it. Well, a, well, Billy Davis, the gentleman I told you about earlier, he became my mentor. So when I started writing because of him. And uh, when the song, that song, that particular song came to me, I, I, it came to me in my sleep, the whole song, all the lyrics. Hmm. I heard a choir singing it. Hmm. And I wrote it out and sung it on my guitar and called Billy up, said, I got a song I'm sending to you. And, and when I sent it to him, he says, this is perfectly written. Who helped you? And I said, I got it in my sleep. He goes, perfect. And he published it. And, uh, and so that was the beginning for me. So I've been, been, I got a whole bunch of songs now. And some good, some not so good. <laughs> But, you know, you got to keep writing. Barry, sure. Gordy, Barry Gordy did have a great tip in his book, To Be Loved, uh, keep writing every day. Write yeah. something every day. That's, what that's he, true. That's a quote from Barry Gordy. And, and when I met Barry, I told him, I said, I'll follow your quote. He goes, what quote? Write something every day. He went, oh. <laughs> I said, because I... Uh, if you don't practice, you lose it. It's, it's like a muscle, mm -hmm. it'll atrophy. If you yeah. got the creative juices, once yeah. you get them flowing, and then once you start writing that one, mm -hmm. five more yeah. can come into your yeah. head. Yeah, I got a lot of songs. Now, I remember you talking about uh, a very funny story concerning Little Richard. Now, you did <laughs> <laughs> you you did some Little Richard impersonations, correct? Yeah, yeah, I did mul multiple because um, you're working with legends after a while, Paul Revere came to me and said, listen, uh, we got to change the acts, and we can't fly anybody in, so what else you do? I'm like, huh? <laughs> I'm like, what else I do? Yeah, can't you do Stevie Wonder? I'm like, no, Stevie Wonder is hard to do. He goes, Jackie Wilson's hard to do. Give me a Stevie Wonder. And he walked away. And I, and I said, is he serious? And they go, oh, yeah. Because he went around and asked everybody. 
if they had a second act. So I put together Stevie Wonder, and next thing I know, in the next three years, I'm doing strictly Stevie Wonder. Uh, then later on, my good friend Gary Moore out of, out of Hawaii, uh, he does Little Richard, but a, a gig came up that he did not want to go do. It was in Australia. And he calls me up and says, hey, man, uh, I got a Little Richard gig in Australia. You should do it. I'm like, what are you talking about? I don't do Little Richard. He goes, ah, you can do it. I'm like, you crazy. I said, that's your gig. He goes, no, nah, man, I'm not going to do it. So I told him to call you. And sure enough, the, the, the promoter called me. And he said, uh, I hear you can do a good Little Richard. I said, well, uh, I do good at everything I do. I had never done Little Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Confidence <laughs> yeah. king. I had never done Little Richard. And I, did, and, I, and I put it together and went out to uh, Australia and worked it out. And then next thing I knew, another gig on his heels came in Minnesota at the uh, Mystic Lake Casino. And Little Richard saw me. And I was scared to death because he walked into the room. And I'm full on, hey, everybody. Woo! <laughs> Shout out, baby. I'm doing the whole nine yards, playing the song. Lucille! You know, the whole thing. He's in there, and he's sitting there like this. <laughs> and, 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 and I got, we, you know, we have a whole production. We got dancers. We got the piano. We got the whole nine yards. 45-minute show. And little Richard comes, and him and his, I don't know if it was bodyguard or who the guy was, they stood there in the back and watched the whole show. And I'm like, like, oh, God, <laughs> little Richard is here. <laughs> <laughs> And then after the show, the entertainment director, oh, Richard wants to meet you. I'm great. I'm taking. <laughs> so he's like, get clean up. I'll take you up to his room. Takes me up to the suite, and little Richard looks at me. We walk in. Little Richard goes, "How much they pay you to be me?" <laughs> and I'm like, uh, uh, it's, "It's." And I'm looking at the entertainment director, like, say something. He goes, "Okay, you guys got it." He walks out. <laughs> and little Richard's in there cooking for his band. He's in this huge suite. He's cooking fried chicken, potato salad. I mean, he's cooking for the band. And I'm like, um, it's, it's an honor to do, do you, Mr. Richard. You, 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 you know, you're the king of rock and roll. That's right, baby. That's who I am. You ought, to be doing who, you ought to be doing your daddy. That's who you should be doing. I know who you are. And I went, well, they don't want my daddy right now. <laughs> That's what I said. I said, I do him, but they don't want him right now. <laughs> he goes, mm-hmm. Are you hungry? I said, uh, sure. He goes, I said, but I, I'm, I'm fine. I've eaten. Oh, you don't want none of my chicken? I said, yes, sir. I have a piece of chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and he was nice to me. He was, he was nice. But at first, he scared the crap out of me. <laughs> That's so cute. How much they pay you? <laughs> I was like, uh, nothing. Well, you know, hardly nothing. <laughs> Which was true. <laughs> so, <laughs> those those magnetism, I mean, they, you, you got him down. He, it had to be almost scary well, because he's seeing himself with what you're doing. Well, you know what was funny was um, I realized I did a play, the Jackie Wilson play. Uh, it was a play, uh, a, a guy named uh, Norbert uh, called me up in, when I was living in Hawaii. Same year I wrote that song, It's About Time. He said, hey, I, I think you should play Jackie Wilson in my play. I'm going to fly you out and do this and send the contract. I was excited. I went out. And guess what I learned? I love acting. Because hmm. I get in there and I, I learn my lines. And then I, they gave me room to improvise. And I started improvisation without knowing what the word was. Because some of the, the, the lines that they gave me didn't make sense. And I, I said, Norbert, can I, I talk to you about this? And he goes, what? I said, this don't make sense. If I'm going to say this, this seems obviously the blah, blah, blah. Well, what do you want to say? And I said, this. He goes, just go with it. That was nice. Yeah. And I couldn't believe it. The audience was following me. And, and I, I, I would say a line and look at the audience like, uh, this roar. I fell in love with it. I was like, <gasps> I fell in love with it. You know That's what I mean? Because you're a hand. <laughs> no. <laughs> when I hear this, you know, I'll do these faces. And uh, one scene, Sam Cooke dies. Uh, I find out Sam Cooke is killed. And, 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 and I'm, on, I'm, I'm hurting, and I can see the audience hurting with me. Hmm. I loved it. I was like, I like this. And so I, got, I, I really got hooked. So it's the acting. So to play Little Richard or Rick James or Elvis or whoever, it's the acting yeah. that I like. And more than the singing. The singing, I have to figure out how to do it, but the acting is what I love doing. And so that's why the characters come easy for me. I had a, a psychologist said to me, she was sitting in the audience on one of the cruise ship shows, and she came to me and said, I'm a psychologist. Oh, that's good. She goes, I want to read you and study you because you went to Ray Charles, the Little Rich, the Johnny Mathis, the Nat King Cole, and every one of those people you were. 
And I said, thank you. <laughs> she goes, I really want to study you. I said, what are you saying? I'm crazy? <laughs> but that's <laughs> but the acting, like you were saying. It's that's the acting. Coming I, through. Yeah, and, and I, didn't, I didn't know I loved to act. I, I, I love it. Yes, I did another play, um, a gospel play, which I won't do it ever again, but I, I did, they had me play uh, a character called uh, Strife, which is the devil. Ooh. I, really, I really dove into that character. And uh, it was a major principal role, and I, oof, uh, uh, my wife at the time thought I was evil. Because <laughs> on the stage, I was in that character. Off the stage, hmm. I'm back to me. Well, that's the key, though. Yeah. That's how, that's really important that you're able to separate but, but it. But when I read about other actors, they can't. Like, I read about... It's um, a different methodology. Yeah, yeah. I read, what's his name? Um, the, the great black actor, Denzel. He said he has to take off two or three months to get out of the character hmm. that he built in. Also, Holly Berry, same thing. She has to take a lot of time off to get out of whatever movie she was in because she they really dive into the character. They they dive deep into it. So, but I one is not better than the other. It's it's great that you're able to do it that way, mm -hmm. you know, and not be like so affected where it's yeah. debilitating if you're mm -hmm. in a debilitating right. situation right. as the character. Right, right. Um, but you know, whatever works for people to get the job done. Yeah. Really. And sometimes you have to either put on lots of weight or lose lots of weight. Yeah, There's yeah, a lot of different yeah. things oh, depending man. on the situation. You see some of the actors and what they go through and put themselves through. Oh, God yeah. bless them. When, once you get the bug, you'd be surprised. Yeah, yeah. But I had the bug when I was doing that stage play. Trust me. And then when I did the second one, oh, man. Yes, I'm an actor. Yeah. <laughs> Well, speaking of fun, we had a couple of real quick questions we wanted to ask you. A little, little bit less serious, if you will. Okay. Uh, first one is, I, I can't help but uh, think that over the years, uh, you've probably been given some, or been asked to sign some pretty unique things. Fans can be pretty passionate about what they want to have autographed. No oh boy. Uh, <laughs> what are some of the more Next unusual... Question. <laughs> <laughs> So, how about I rephrase the question? Have you been asked to sign some unusual or unique things or places in your day? Absolutely. Next question. Okay. Uh, we understand, I heard a rumor that your favorite female trio might be a band called Trey Bella. Is that true? I, I, uh, uh, the disc I have to do a disclaimer on that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, and the have last... Have you seen these cats? Yes. Wow. The, uh, the audience might know, not know who Trey Bella is. Well, they're going... You're going to. You're going to. In fact, I, they, let you in on a little secret. Big secret. Yeah. We've got a member of that incredible female trio right here. There she is. <laughs> and that is actually where Bobby and I met. On the cruise ship. We were uh, singing on a world cruise ship with Holland America. Right. We both said hello very politely, and then then at dinner, he walks by again. And this time I'm having dinner with my band, one of my bandmates, and so we finally, I think I, I said, said hi, yeah. and you said hi, and then I said, "Are you a performer?" And he's like, "Yes." I'm like, "We are too." And so that was it. That was it. Yeah. He sat down, and we uh, and all we, of us talked all night. Uh, we talked all night, and then before the cruise was over, we performed together. Yes. Yeah, yes. We we did a, oh, wow. a, a dance set. We, we, it was great. Bobby was so, Bobby is always so popular whenever he does a show and everyone on board loved him. I pay people. The captain <laughs> and the captain's wife and anyway, so they asked Bobby instead of doing, each act would do two shows. Right. So instead of Bobby's second show being just like a performance where he's on stage and the audience is watching, they wanted it to be a dance party yeah. because of his style of music. It's really fun. People want mm -hmm. to get up. So it turned into this big party where people were dancing on stage with Bobby in it the was audience. Crazy. They moved all the tables, and Bobby <laughs> said, Why doesn't Trey Bella come and do a song, and then you can sing back up for me on a few songs? Mm -hmm. So we if sang. If they wanted to. And of course, I didn't we're want like. To insult him, yes. They were headliners as well. So I said, If you want to, you don't have to. You know? And they go, Oh, we're going to sing. And they got dressed up and they jumped, they came on that stage and turned it out. It was, I said, we need to stay together forever, you know. And uh, I wanted to do, I want to do a million shows with these girls. I mean, they're very, very, very talented. They all have their own unique style. They're beautiful, so all the old ladies hated them. And, 
<laughs> so they couldn't look at them. They couldn't look at the husbands. <laughs> it was hilarious because these old ladies, you know, they're from New York, uh, Jersey, and that. Oh, who are they? What are they doing? You know, it's hilarious. And the old men like, oh, it's not true. <laughs> this is it was it's funny. Not true. And I, and, but if they did a, a fabulous show, and then uh, we worked together, and, and that was fabulous. And so I've been ever since been trying to get us to do some shows together because I we think will. it's a great combination. We will, is it? for sure. Baby, let's cruise. Sing it, Smokey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, that if when that show, I don't want to say if, when that show happens, I think we'll be covering that right here on the Rosie and Bill show. That's going to be a lot of fun. You it guys playing there. That'll now, be fun. That'll be awesome. You know, there's so many more questions we want to ask you, but you I gotta run. have to go. Oh, yeah. I got to go. You got a show to do. So uh, yeah. we want to just thank Bobby Brooks Wilson for sharing his life, his stories, yes. and his talent. Oh, thank and you guys for And it is such a pleasure. Me to have you here. Oh, You're such a beautiful soul. So are you. And so are you, Bill. And thank you very much. And we're going to be right behind you because we are going to be at the show. Oh, Looking no! Looking forward to being at the show. <laughs> but before you go, one last question. What's that? Who's your favorite host of the Rosie and Bill show? My favorite host of the Rosie and Bill show? That's an easy one, Bill! Yeah! <laughs> As usual, make a difference for someone every day and make every day a great day. Go Packers! <laughs> Be kind to yourself. Go, Go Birds! birds. <laughs> we'll see you next week. That's hilarious. Uh, anyway, they, were, they wrote this song and a couple of others, one of the songs was dogging around, but this particular song was a dance song. So uh, let's get ready to dance. Are you ready? All right, Jim!